Hey, everybody. Mike here. First of all, I wanted to thank all of you for listening to On Time and for your continued support. You may have noticed we've been releasing shorter, more topic-focused episodes lately, and this has allowed us to achieve a more frequent release schedule. However, for all of you that enjoyed our original roundtable format, I wanted to assure you that we haven't abandoned it. We have some great guests lined up, and full-length roundtable discussions are on the way. But in between these original recipe episodes, we'll continue to release our mini topic-focused shows. The result? More on time, more often. So thank you again for listening. Let's get the show on the road. We're back. And we're going to discuss a topic that if you have listened to On Time at all, you've heard me bring it up. And that is our great George Daniels legacy, the coaxial escapement. That's right. We're going to discuss a lot of the negativity that's floating around. I'll be honest, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, don't get a coaxial because no one knows how to service them, which is probably true. I would say no one knows how to service them is the right answer. The problem is sometimes people give you a, a very similar but different reason and they say, oh, they're terrible once it comes to getting them serviced. That's not the case. The case is nobody knows what they're doing, which has nothing to do with it being a coaxial, but I'll let Manuel expand on that topic. Yeah, please, Mr. Master (laughs) Watchmaker. Well, thank you. Well, I could say this, and I know it's going to garner a lot of uh, flack, but I don't really care. uh, (laughs) Welcome to On Time Podcast. Yes. Right. So I would say that at least from my visits, from my observations, from my various positions in the industry, I would say that 70% of those who call themselves watchmakers don't really do it properly or just have been trained or just don't know any better. That being said, the skills of a service watchmaker, again, a person who services the watch, it's a completely different science. So unfortunately, many people, for a variety of reasons, which we'll discuss at future times, I'm sure, is they are not able to service the watch, even a non-coaxial movement properly. Right. That's what I mean. So now talking about coaxials, what's specific or more different is the extra level of finesse you have to have in servicing that watch, specifically the escapement portion. And I know that people have said, well, you know, it's marketed as you don't need to oil it. Correct. You don't need to oil it for lubrication purposes. Well, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. What people say is you don't need to oil it. What the truth is, is that you don't need to lubricate it. You don't need to lubricate the acting surfaces for lubrication purposes. You need to use an amount much smaller than a grain of sand. Like we're talking maybe three, four times smaller than a grain of sand. Wow. Onto the specific portions of that coaxial escapement tooth. Not for lubrication purposes, but simply to act as a dampening agent. So Shock absorber. Shock absorber. And if you don't do it, well, the watch will work, but after weeks, months, whatever, it may cause issues, and that's where you run into problems. Now, again, that is the complex part. The easy part that non-trained watchmakers, the first mistake they'll make is that as they're trying to take the balance wheel out, if they do it the traditional way, they can damage the coaxial escapement. Mm -hmm. You have to rotate it a certain number of degrees before you can actually safely remove that balance wheel. So if that watch was serviced by an untrained individual and has caused damage, and then that watch started having issues, then you wouldn't know if you were a second buyer, right. if that was the case. Let me ask you a question here. Is it more difficult to service the coaxial? Just based off of what I hear, it sounds like it is. If you haven't had brand-specific training by Omega, then I don't think you should be servicing it. Right, I understand that. But question at hand is, do you absolutely need to be a better watchmaker? You're just exercising a higher level of care, that's all. So, Which you should have anyways sure. when you're working on any watch. So any qualified watchmaker that's gone through their studies mm-hmm. should be able to service a coaxial without any problems. Correct. So what's the problem? Misinformation, disinformation, myths. I don't think there is a problem. Well, there is a problem, but it's not with the coaxial. The problem is, is not (laughs) enough watches have coaxial movements. That is a problem. That is the problem. Are you listening, everyone else but Omega? To address these myths that are floating around, I've heard so many arguments, and not even about the coaxial, just in 
quote unquote watchmakers in general that my so called watchmaker damaged my watch or they couldn't do a good job is because they really aren't watchmakers to begin with. Or they haven't been properly trained, but that's another topic. Right. I mean, that's that's that makes sense. Listen, if you're going to be a professional, be a professional. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, you could apply that to any and all industries. Right. So if you don't get your correct training, then well, you're going to fail. And in that case, failure is not very good. You know, like if you fail on a say Roger Smith <laughs> or you know a Daniel's anniversary piece, it's not going to go well for you. Well, I don't know. Somehow Carly Fiorina seemed to make failure work for her. Uh, <laughs> Let's get that. Okay. All right, moving on. So there's no sense in disguising this. There is only one company that's making these in volume, and that's Omega. George Daniels has passed away, and Roger Smith is, let's say, not mass producing. So with the Omega, <laughs> with the Omega 2500, which no surprise, is based on the ETA 2892, evolved directly from another Omega caliber, which is the 1120. So let's say there are two differences between these two that I know of. One is, of course, the coaxial escapement, but there's another difference that may also be a cause for the reason that people don't like the coaxial. It has nothing to do with the coaxial. That is that the 2500 is a free-sprung balance. So does that require a greater degree of knowledge or, as you said, finesse, versus a standard regulator? Actually, I would say the free sprung is probably easier. easier. I, I would say it's easier because you don't have the issue of the curb pins. Right. Unfortunately, many modern watchmakers, in quotes, don't really know the science behind it. For me, it's easier to deal with a free sprung balance. Versus For you, but the question I'm asking is the misinformation that comes along with the coaxial, and, and it probably is mostly related to the 2500, because I'll make a guess that that is, to date, the highest produced coaxial caliber. They probably made more 2500s mm -hmm. than anything else. But the two primary differences are one, the coaxial, and two, the free sprung. And so I guess what I'm asking is, for the person who is working on watches that is not a watchmaker, mm -hmm. the same people that complain about the coaxial, would, would those people complain or would they be stymied in a similar way by a free sprung system. I would investigate the source of the complaint and then to make sure it's legitimate. And then, you know, I think there's a lot of blame shifting going on. I personally think the coaxial is a great product, timekeeping superior to virtually anything mechanical that you can think of that's wrist worn at least. Mm -hmm. So where is the problem? Is the problem is people don't know how to service it properly. That's crazy. That's the same, yeah. Sorry, but I would say probably it's less forgiving for ham-handed, ham-fisted people. You know, those who don't know how to service the watch properly. So if you have an individual who is, this is zero, while well, down here is zero and in the middle is medium, they could probably get away with servicing a regular lever escapement, mm -hmm. even if it's done, albeit poorly, and it'll still get away with it. They can make it tick. They can make a tick. All right. Okay, but the coaxial is probably less forgiving because they're incompetent. <laughs> Understood. I understand okay, that. I mean, yes. That's as simple as that. So yeah, that, that is actually incredibly clear. You know what blows my mind is the fact, how many coaxial 2500s do you think Omega has produced since Since they 1999 slash 2000? Well, let's say they produce at least 2 million. At least, it's probably a low bomb. It's probably closer to 5 million. That's a big number. Yeah. That's a really big number. It's not like, say, I don't know, give me a small production watch company. It's not like, it's uh, not like uh, the Peugeot. Yeah. Is, is throwing coaxial movements in there and expecting people to move or, or to work on them rather and, and work on them well. I don't know the, the standard procedure of servicing an FP Journe is usually anyway if you're not going the factory route, but that's a lot of movements. Oh, yeah. If an automaker releases two million cars, mm -hmm. I think there's enough mechanics that know how to work on it. Well, well, the bottom line is coaxial has been mass produced for 17 years now. You know, it's been phased in. So when Omega started in 99, 2000, they, it was only in one model, but it's been phased in across their lineup. And now they have a couple of exceptions that don't have the coaxial and everything they make does have it. And remember that Omega has been offering free training to watchmakers on the coaxial at least 10 plus years, 12 years. Free training. Free training, yes. <laughs> That means they don't charge you for the training. You have to go on your own dime and they'll offer free lunch, of course. <laughs> and then they'll actually even provide free tools, brand specific tools 
to be able to oil and observe the coaxial escapement. So they've been very, very supportive. You know, they've really gone out of their way to help with the service. I think if more brands were to adapt it, maybe more watchmakers would be a little bit more enthused about servicing them, or maybe the the negativity would be kind of melt away a little bit. Because if it's a strictly like you know we discussed this, it's mm-hmm. like cool. They have this incredible thing that they technically kind of own, even though the patents run out. They kind yeah. of own it. And yeah. if you see coaxial, you think Omega. Yeah, you know, before I understood who George Daniels was and what kind of an achievement the coaxial was, I just thought it was an exercise in branding, like Rolex with Oyster and so on and so forth. Well, you know, there was somebody that I spoke to who's a fairly respected figure in watchmaking, and I will say that when he said he said something very similar to me, and uh, he no longer was a very respected figure <laughs> in watchmaking, when he said, "Oh, you know, that was just a, it's all just marketing." So, well, but it is functionally superior. I remember he said, uh, yes, but uh, it is not chronometrically superior. They only do it for marketing. I said, <laughs> but it is. But it is. But it needs oil. And they said it would not need oil. I said, yes, but the, un- the oil functions. And this was a conversation I actually had. Said, but the oil functions as a shock absorber, as dampening, not as a lubricant. That's totally different because the dampening properties of oil degrade much less over time than its lubricity properties anyway. To add, I think you know this oiling business started out when they were running it at higher BPHs. Right. So, and as they reduced the BPH, the beats per hour, you know, the frequency of the uh, balance oil, I think the quantities are a little less and almost probably, you know, I think they've been working on, you know, eliminating that. So, I have but, a question. What, what do they run it before and what do they bring it down to? I see. could answer that question. I know it's 25, <laughs> 200. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> but go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. I'll, you, I'll, you have, uh, you've done more historical study on it. So, so please. I do have to correct you a little bit, and I apologize for sure, having to do this, but actually, Omega's chronographs still run at the 28,800 with the coaxial, so they have not reduced the operational frequency there. And for the non-chronograph movements, they did reduce the frequency by a very small amount. They went from 28,800 to 25,200, which is a very odd frequency. It's actually that is. three and even, a half I don't think hertz. I've even heard that before. I... I don't want to say they're the only ones that do it, but I'll say they're the only ones I know of that have ever done that frequency, three and a half hertz. Right, okay. And also they've changed the design of the escapement to yes. where it's on a three levels versus two levels. Correct. That was a very big revision that they made within the production of the 2500 caliber that carried over into all of their new calibers. Okay. You know, I'll just add here that you have seen firsthand on my timing machine the yes. performance of your coaxial watch. Yes. And I think it blew away all the other brands out of the water. We actually had to get together, and uh, there is a picture of this somewhere in back in my Instagram history. Manuel showed up to the LA Watch Gang and brought a timing machine. And we had Moser's there. We had... There was a Richard, lot. There was, I mean, a, there was, a, there was lot. a Richard meal that that well, that's night. Junk. There was a Richard meal. There was a there was a Mosier. There was a brand new day date. There was my humble Deville coaxial and a plethora of other watches. And I can say, and Manuel can substantiate this: the coaxial blew everything out of the water in terms of timing. It had, I believe, the maximum positional variation was one second per day. If and, my memory. And, in all, and I think virtually in all the positions, in all the vertical positions, we tested it in the vertical yes. positions, and I, I was pleasantly surprised and pleasantly you know, shocked that in front of everyone that we actually saw that performance. Yeah. This was a watch that, that is a semi-daily watch for me, the one that I have spoken about during previous recordings that's all over my Instagram. This watch is lived with daily, went onto the timing machine, and just stole gold by a mile. Yeah. Well, there's the proof. And I'm assuming this is not something that is out of the ordinary. You you grab a bunch of coaxials, you're probably going to get very similar performance. We're not the first ones to discuss, obviously, Oh no! the the significance of what the coaxial movement is, or the, the coaxial escapement, rather. But it's still kind of strange, you know, because like, a lot of people talk about it, but there's still some kind of apprehension against it. People are afraid of 
things that are new or unknown. There are still cars that don't use disc brakes to this day, That's true. which is shocking. There are, you know, until recently, there were cars that didn't have ABS. It's just a question of just because it's better does not mean that everyone will do it. Yeah. And those that don't do it will grasp at any straw to justify their position for inferiority without mincing words. They right. have to find some way to defend themselves. Right. There's so much more to talk about. There is when a it comes lot to, the to talk coaxial, about here. But, but we're going to save that because we, well, we have further episodes that we need to do. And, and quite frankly, we're running out of time. We're addressing the very common myths, right. the common negativity, and like with the other episodes, just laying it to rest. Sure. And we're also going to talk about why other brands aren't using the coaxial escapement in their movements. Yes. And I'll give you guys a little hint. Cost. This episode of On Time was recorded and engineered by Michael Senderovich with supervision by Tim Hatiyama. Team OTP is Ken Shu Production and Savada and Dune on social media. Our theme song was composed and recorded by Hubie Wang. And our expert on this episode is Manuel Yazigia. Follow him on Instagram at Manuel Watchmaker. And while you're on Instagram, make sure to follow us as well at On Time Podcast. For the entire OTP team, this is Mike. And this is Chase. Thank you for listening to On Time. 